Thank you and good morning everybody. We have a great panel um, and the focus today is on regional, rural and remote and the issues of quality and partnerships uh, in improving some of the very significant gaps that you will probably know about between metropolitan and regional areas. And just to uh, steal a little bit of Dennis's thunder, um, he was responsible for the strategy into regional, remote, rural um, education. And the nub of the problem that that strategy addressed was the disparity between uh, regional and metropolitan outcomes for students. We know that 45% of students who are from regional, remote and rural areas in Australia are uh, less likely than metropolitan students to obtain a higher tertiary education qualification. And 50% are less likely to uh, obtain a, a bachelor's degree by the time they're 35. So this is a significant challenge and the panel today is going to address this from a number of perspectives. Um, and we're very lucky to have panel members who are situated in regional and rural Australia. Um, so I'm going to be asking each panel member in turn to address the, the topic. As you will know, um, quality is a multifaceted concept and um, we can measure it in all sorts of ways. Um, for the regional context, I think we're really focused in this panel on looking at the quality of the education experience and how in particular partnerships play a role in transforming lives um, in those communities. So I'm going to um, uh, ask uh, Dennis to kick off and um, to explain uh, the context for some of this and the role that the, um, the, the national strategy um, uh, for regional, uh, remote, uh, rural and remote um, higher education plays in addressing quality. So over to you, Dennis. Uh, thank you very much and uh, thank you for the opportunity to attend this very important conference. Can I acknowledge the traditional custodians of this land and pay my respects to Elders past, present and emerging? And uh, can I acknowledge my fellow panel members? And it's really great to be here as part of this panel. Can I say the, a couple of things that we know for certain? We know that we live in an increasingly competitive and fast-moving world. We also know for certain that high quality skills and education are the keys to success for individual opportunity, but also keys to success for Australia in this fast moving, increasingly competitive world. We know that in a 21st century Australia, that Australia can, should and must provide all its citizens, particularly its young people, with every opportunity or fair access to gain that skills and education that helps them grow and develop. But also as a country, uh, being a relatively small country in terms of population, that we need to be firing on all cylinders. We simply can't afford as a country in this modern world to be uh, running short on one or two cylinders, having a significant portion of our population not having the skills and the education to contribute to the growth and development and maintenance of our living standards. So on equity grounds and uh, on social grounds and on economic grounds, we need to make sure that our education system, particularly at the grassroots, right through to higher education, tertiary education, skills development and training, that we have all our citizens having that opportunity. And we can't afford to lock out certain members of our community, whether they be from regional, rural, remote areas, whether they be from indigenous communities, whether they be from newly arrived uh, ethnic communities. We must ensure that all our citizens have every opportunity to contribute for their own purpose, but also for our country. The National Regional, Rural and Education Strategy was about exactly that. And as Helen has said, whether you look at NAPLAN results, whether you look at year 12 attainment, 
whether you look at higher education, participation and completion, that regional and rural remote students are being disadvantaged significantly. That is unfair, it is inequitable, and Australia, and particularly regional Australia, miss out on the economic benefits of that contribution. So what our strategy was about was improving uh, those outcomes for regional and rural remote students and looking at practical ways to do it. So certainly some of the issues were access for those students and whether you look at study hubs in regional and rural areas, whether you look at a stepping stone approach, whether you look at regional campuses of our universities and our vocational education training systems being more diverse. And fundamentally, the other thing that is absolutely essential is internet access. High speed, good quality, reliable internet access is absolutely fundamental to uh, school education, fundamental to skills development, fundamental to higher education overall. We need to improve financial support and we've made recommendations in that area. We need to improve, and some people describe it as aspiration, I don't particularly like that word because I know that regional and rural remote students have exactly the same aspirations as their city cousins. But what they don't have is the confidence and belief that if they work hard, they'll have those opportunities to achieve. So we've got to address that with better careers advisory services, better vet in schools, and we need a stronger role from the community. We need better support for regional, rural and remote teachers, principals and schools, and certainly that is about a partnership approach. We need partnerships between state and federal government. We need partnerships from higher education providers and schools. We need partnerships to deliver on this between the community and all of those people to make sure our schools are not just good hubs for education, but they nurture those aspirations and support those aspirations and support those students. We need to improve support students, the services to students. How many of our universities have special programs for international students to under, because they understand those international students have difficulties adjusting to coming to live in Australia, coming so far away? Yet those same universities have negligible services for the student who comes a thousand kilometres from outback Queensland, from northern New South Wales, from Western Australia, or even from Mildura or Casterton to come to university. They have little or no support services. And any wonder the dropout rate in that first year of regional rural students is significantly higher. We need to have better support services for those students. We need to look at new ways of delivering education, and I welcome the moves to look at micro-credentialing, look at rec better recognition of prior learning, better articulation, and guarantees that when people do have these uh, micro-credentials or do uh, vet subjects, that they actually will get those credits when they articulate into other opportunities because many regional and rural students need to have those stepping stones and those pathways. We need to also look at how we make sure we can use our regional university campuses, not just as centres of education, but as centres of community leadership in terms of decentralising population and investment across Australia. And I'll just leave it by saying the final thing that I'll say once again is internet services are fundamental and uh, we can't have a digital divide because that will entrench the division that is already there and we need to overcome it. And finally, if I put in the context of what we're talking about today, the only way this can be achieved is by collaborative partnerships among all players, whether it be across governments, across the higher education sector, the school education sector, but most importantly, involving the local communities and participation with those local communities. Because I believe we've got enormous talent, skill and ability right across Australia, and particularly in regional and rural remote Australia, that is being uh, disadvantaged, being uh, untapped, and I think in terms of fairness and equity, in terms of our future of our country, we need to make sure that every person has every opportunity into the future. Thank you very much.
Thank you very much. I think that provides us with really good context. And in case you haven't looked at the strategy, um, it has seven really important recommendations and over 30 actions. And we're really looking forward to seeing the implementation of those over um, the next few years, we hope. So I'd like to turn to Maria next and, and ask Maria, um, what does your research on partnering with schools to in increase participation rates for equity groups tell us about the challenges and opportunities for tertiary education in regional and rural Australia? Wonderful, thank you. Okay, now I'm on. Um, so what I wanted to share with you is actually one of those practical partnership solutions. Um, and it's the Queensland Widening Participation Consortium, which some of you may have heard about. Just this month, the Queensland Widening Participation Consortium celebrated 10 years. So I think that's just a wonderful achievement in and of itself of sustained outreach from universities, but also a sustained partnership between universities. Um, and we did some research on this in 2018, but I thought I might give you a background as to the partnership itself because I think it's a great example of best practice. Um, and it began in 2009, obviously, under and spearheaded uh, by the leadership of Mary Kelly at QUT um, and is currently under the leadership of Melinda Mann um, from Central Queensland University. What happened was Queensland, uh, looking at its geography, it's made up of a large proportion of regional, rural and remote areas. Um, and a number of universities, seven of them, have their headquarters in Queensland. And they came together in a non-competitive consortium-based approach to look at ways that they can reduce duplication with universities, multiple universities going to the same schools while other schools were missing out. So they wanted to address this issue that there were gaps where some students in regional, rural and remote areas weren't receiving any information to help them inform their decision-making about the option to go to university and what their choices might be, while others perhaps were being saturated. So the group came together and what they did was, as a collective, uh, focused on widening participation as different to marketing. So I just wanted to probably clarify that difference. So I guess in its rawest sense, widening participation was about this idea of the message going out to stimulate interest in higher education, to show it as an opportunity for people, but it was about the sense of come to university, while the marketing message is come to our university or my university. So that distinction was really clear and that's why it was non-competitive because it was really about achieving social justice, giving people information and opportunities regardless of where they lived. And as we know, people and places are knitted together. Uh, how and where we grow up can define our points of view, where we see ourselves in the world, um, uh, what we value uh, and also what we see as potential careers around us. So this approach made sure that the universities in many ways pooled their resources, shared best practice, and then was able to scale up best practice where it worked, but at the same time having the opportunity to tailor interventions and programs for the context of the place. Um, we know that some places that are regarded as remote, um, two places may be regarded as remote communities, but have very different employment careers and opportunities around them. So what the consortium did was effectively put, uh, create seven zones or clusters in Queensland and each university had carriage of a zone that was generally closest to their main campus and the schools within that zone fell under their responsibility to deliver outreach to. The zones weren't equal because they were based on you know, obviously where population is and the number of schools and those that had zones that were more complex in fact, uh, you know, where there was the tyranny of distance and trying to deliver people rich uh, activities uh, cost a lot more, um, were equally compensated for that as well. Um, and so this approach had sort of two levels of partnering. Not only have the universities worked together for now 10 years, uh, created a body of knowledge and scholarship and a community of practice that is very um, engaging and agentic and positive. Um, but there was also a second layer to this in that the universities worked with those schools in their cluster to deliver messages and to embed uh, outreach messages within the school's curriculum or to engage the schools, um, and doing so in a sustained manner. So if you're a principal, for example, in a remote school, having to find and trying to contact multiple universities um, and having multiple universities approaches you perhaps adds a lot more burden to your day, 
whereas this approach, each school had a contact university and that university had those points and touch points at which they could deliver material to. The consortium focused on both people rich as well as digital rich resources to send those messages out and to deliver those. And really it was about exactly what, what Dennis said, it was about choice. It was about giving people those choices, um, but also understanding the context in which they live. So the consortium has been quite effective in this space for some while, and in 2017, 2018, we did a research project that looked at really what was the key trigger points or the catalysts that were leading to increased um, uh, enrolments and interest in, in higher education. Um, and what we found was basically school engagement was the key. So those schools where the leadership of the school, the principals and deputy principals and the staff um, were effectively engaged by the universities, we saw an uplift in interest and in applications and offers um, for students to come on, uh, come on to higher education. Uh, and so that was a really key part because I think sometimes principals are overlooked when in fact they're the linchpin they really are, because in these particularly regional, rural and remote communities, they don't just fulfil their job, but they're actually leaders in the community. They fill a number of uh, community roles uh, that are essential to sort of uh, building. So they have sway, they have influence, and those that were more engaged, we saw an uplift in activities. So I'll leave it at that, but that was a summary and I think a, a great example of partnership that has worked. Thank you so much, Maria. I just think it's a fabulous example of a consortium approach that is really having impact and something we can all learn from. Um, now I'd like to uh, turn to Cathy, who is coming up to submitting her PhD. Cathy is, um, it, it lives in Horsham and uh, is, um, uh, has many roles in that rural community. And she's conducted her PhD through the RISER program, which is the Regional in Incubator for Social and Economic Research Collaboration. And I, I'd like to invite Cathy just to share some of the highlights of this experience and how this initiative has engaged community in shaping a PhD. Sure, I'll have to steal your microphone. <laughs> All right, um, so I am a rural person. I live out at Horsham, which is about four hours west. It took me all day on the bus and train to get here. Actually, it was bus, train and then bus again. Um, so rural isolation is, re is real and rural disadvantage is real. I'm more likely to die earlier than you people. I'm more likely to miss out on accessing education, significantly more likely. Um, <coughs> And uh, I am more likely to be unable to access basic things like internet connections and <coughs> be more likely to miss out on being able to move between communities. Um, things are harder out in the country, but uh, I am passionate about uh, improving rural education. I'm passionate about improving opportunities for rural people. Um, and I lived some of my time in Melbourne uh, working in advocacy and decided to return to my community a little bit over a decade ago. Uh, so part of my journey was understanding my community really, really well so that we could actually make a difference. So that's what drove me to do my PhD. I do my work through the Regional Incubator for Social and Economic Research and that group was established out of a sheer frustration that a lot of the money that goes to rural communities to address some of this disadvantage I just briefly mentioned to you uh, actually then flows to consultants um, to think, do the hard thinking about problems. And where do those consultants live? In Melbourne, in Sydney, occasionally in Bendigo. Not a lot. Um, so in order to change the trajectory of rural experience, I think it's important to invest in rural people. It's important to invest in the people who live there and deeply understand and experience the problems. So 
To start on that trajectory, we established three PhD scholarships in the region, and I am one of those. Um, so we, we looked at um, disadvantage in a range of ways and looked at how we can improve opportunities. So my work has been about understanding the ways in which rural people uh, are disadvantaged and understanding the ways in which we actually can sometimes reinforce our own disadvantage in the region. And we also established uh, a research unit, so we look at, we do projects in our community, we look at um, ways in which um, to change the trajectory of our region, and we actually do research here for our community rather than sending that experience and expertise up the road. Now, one of the really significant problems we've had, um, being three of us out there as PhD students, is capacity. So uh, our community said to us, yes, we like what you're doing. It's really interesting. Um, can you do more? And we said, well, no. Um, we can only do so much. So part of the establishment of of RISER out there was also to, to build undergraduate experience. Um, so uh, I teach the one higher education offering that is available in my community locally, face to face. Uh, it's the only thing you can do in our community without having to go away. Um, you can do some, some nursing, um, but we're the only one that offers a full degree uh, out in our community at this stage. Um, so we do that in order to upskill the people that will sit behind us and um, train up people in our community to do that deep thinking that's necessary to change our trajectory as well. Um, so um, our program has been a wonderful partnership between the community. When we started, um, Often when you do a PhD, someone directs you and says, this is what your project's going to be about. Our projects were not directed in that way. They said, actually, go and sit, talk to people, understand what the, what the issues are and come back to me with the biggest, hairiest, most ugliest problem you can find and we'll turn that into a research question for you. So that's, that's how we initiated our PhD discussions. Our investors, Regional Development Victoria, Federation University, they were really open to saying, um, you're out in your community, what do you think your community needs? Um, so that's been a really, really liberating um, way in which to do research in our community and it's also made us very connected with our community. As part of my work, um, uh, we've, we've gone a long way in terms of understanding some of the issues um, and realising what we've got to do to change. Now, in order to do that, I could, I could stand in my community and berate them all about what we've got to do, but I don't think that works very well. So we actually, um, we actually have a really subtle process of engagement. So I sit on a number of committees, I talk to people, and you know, we just very, very gently work towards change in our community. And our partnerships are real because we live there, um, we care about our community and um, we connect with the people who, who we need to, to get change. Thanks, Cathy. What, what an amazing journey um, that you've been on. Um, I imagine terribly frustrating at times and challenging, but this is a model, I think, that um, can be used to guide future programs and something that we as, as a university are certainly looking to invest in more into the future. Um, now, I've got to make sure we leave plenty of time for questions, but I, I'm going to take the sort of final panel uh, word, um, because we haven't talked a lot about industry collaboration and the importance of industry collaboration in promoting quality in uh, regional rural uh, remote um, education. I just want to give you an example from my own university about um, a long-term partnership um, that, and, and this is the point about partnerships with industry, they do take time 
um, they take um, a lot of effort and attention. And at Federation University, um, at, at our Ballarat uh, campuses, we have a tech park. And the tech park started to be established 20 years ago. And one of the standout partnerships that has really changed the lives of so many local students has been um, our relationship with IBM, who came into our tech park um, as a tenant. And then over the years, uh, the university has built a very solid relationship with them, which has culminated in a work integrated learning um, program, starting with IT, and now um, it's also involving the business uh, school. And this program really brings the students into industry from the get-go. Um, IBM provides good scholarships. The students start uh, their professional practice um, early in their programs. They undertake um, 1,600 hours of professional practice over the course of their study. And they become um, very familiar with um, the big industry projects. Um, most of those students end up getting jobs in IBM, in Ballarat. In fact, about 60% of the employees are graduates from our university. And then they have a global career potential ahead of them. So they start in Ballarat and they may end up working then uh, across Australia um, and globally. Uh, and it's, it's just a really uh, successful model um, and, and a partnership that's been built over time and involves a lot of engagement from the company in um, exposing the students to the real world, to the real projects um, that they're all engaged in from the start. So um, the work has also extended into PTEC. So IBM is involved with um, our Federation College, which looks at getting um, students into uh, education and through a pathway uh, by studying IT. And this is also a very um, successful dimension of the program. So it's just one example. Um, it's not, we're not situated in a remote area, of course, but um, uh, it, it's an example of how we have built um, a model that is now extending uh, into other companies so that any companies that come uh, into our park, usually with support from state government um, in, uh, in assisting to bring them uh, into the university um, location, but it, it really is now uh, every, every single um, tenant, as it were, has a partnership with the university and it's focused around the students focused around work integrated learning, around graduate employability, and now increasingly uh, with a focus on research and innovation. Um, so 20 years in the making, many other um, similar programs now are following suit, but it is an example of, of something that uh, can be done uh, in a partnership um, arrangement with, with industry, with government, and, and with the university. So, um, I think we've had a number of perspectives um, ranging from uh, the broader community to schools to industry and to the strategic approach. And I hope that some of that has stimulated some ideas and questions from the audience.